Have you ever wanted to control a DC motor speed precisely? Or work precisely on LED dimming or communicate with microcontrollers? All of that is possible with one magical technique, pulse width modulation or PWM. What if I told you we could generate it with just a few analog components and no microcontroller? That's exactly what we are building today a full analog PWM generator circuit and trust me, by the end of this video, we'll know how it works and how to design one. So let's start. PWM is like flicking a switch on and off rapidly but cleverly varying how long it's on versus off. This lets us control power. Imagine turning a light on for 70% and off for 30% of the time. And that's how light dimming works. We call that 70% duty cycle. The higher the duty cycle, the brighter the bulb. Or in case of the motor drives, the faster our motor spins. To keep this thing simple and logical, Let's break down the entire PWM generator into three main blocks. First up, the triangular wave generator. Think of this as the heartbeat of the whole system. It continuously creates a voltage that rises and falls. Basically a triangular wave. And this wave will be the reference for creating a PWM signal. Next is the comparator. It takes in the triangular wave from the first block and the modulating input signal from the third block. If the input signal is higher than the triangular wave at any point, the output of the comparator goes high. If not, it goes low. And just like that, we have generated a PWM waveform, a signal that's on for some time and off for the rest, depending on how high our input signal is. The third block ensures the PWM accurately reflects our input voltage. Here is what it does. It takes the input voltage, amplifies it with a gain of minus 1 and centers it around a reference voltage. The result is a smooth, clean voltage that perfectly rides inside the triangular waveforms range. Now, let's see how the circuit of these blocks would look like and how it works. First is a triangular wave generator. Here, we use two op amps. One is a fast comparator and an integrator which integrates the square wave coming from this comparator into a triangular waveform signal. So we use U3 for the integrator and U4 for the square wave generator. The resistor R5 and R6 define the ramp up or ramp down rates. R7 is the feedback resistor for U3. And capacitor C3 is the integrator capacitor and this v ref is the reference midpoint for oscillation. U4 compares the output of U3 to v ref and flips its output accordingly. This toggling is fed back to the integrator U3 which starts ramping up or down based on the polarity. The result is a triangular wave. After that, we use op amp U2 as a comparator. It compares the output of the error amplifier and triangular waveform generator. U2 compares Vs in and V try. If Vs in is greater than this, then output is high. If Vs in is less than V try, then output is low. So, by doing that, we get the PWM output proportional to the input signal. The last part is this error amplifier. The op amp compares our input voltage to a fixed V rep. It provides the signal called Vs in, a signal that tells the comparator how long PWM should stay on. So R1 and R2 create the reference voltage. This PWM generator is extensively used in analog to digital converters with PWM conversion, where it converts analog signals to PWM for further processing or digital transmission. This circuit can also act as the controller for switching DC to DC converter, adjusting the duty cycle for voltage or current regulation. Let's see how we can design this type of circuit. To start with that, 
we need to understand the design requirement or problem statement. The design goal of this circuit is to take an analog voltage input that swings from minus 2 volts to plus 2 volts and convert it into a PWM output signal that ranges from 0 to 5 volts. In other words, the duty cycle of the PWM should vary according to the amplitude of the input voltage. To power the circuit, we use a 5 volt supply. And the reference voltage for the comparison purposes, it's set at around 2.5 volts. This reference is basically the midpoint between 0 and 5 volts, which helps us center everything properly. Now let's break down the circuit into blocks and go through the design calculations one by one. The purpose of this error amplifier is to process the analog input voltage. It takes our input signal, which ranges from minus 2 volts to plus 2 volts, and conditions it so that it fits within the comparison range of the triangular waveform. To do this, we use an op-amp in an inverting configuration with a gain of minus 1. This means, if we give plus 1 volt at the input, it gives us minus 1 volt at the output and vice versa. We select the resistors R3 and R4 as 10 kilo ohms each. So the gain is equal to minus 1. For the reference voltage, we use R1 and R2 also as 10 kilo ohms each. The voltage divider formula gives us 2.5 volts. Next, we need to ensure stability and noise reduction. We place a small capacitor C1 of around 100 picofarads in the feedback path. This capacitor limits the bandwidth of the amplifier, which gives us approximately 159 kilohertz. This is below the switching frequency and helps suppress noise. Additionally, there's another capacitor C2, which we choose as 100 nanofarad to filter the reference voltage and make it steady. It acts like a cushion absorbing any ripple or fluctuation on the VRF line. This block continuously creates a triangular wave with a peak-to-peak -peak voltage of around 2.1 volts and a frequency of approximately 500 kHz. We use another op-amp, U3, as an integrator and pair it with a comparator U4. The comparator flips its output every time the voltage crosses a certain point, which causes the integrator to reverse direction, creating a symmetrical triangular waveform. To control the amplitude, we use a voltage divider with resistor R5 and R6. We already have VRAF as 2.5 volts and R6 as 10 kilo ohms. To achieve 2.1 volts peak to peak, we calculate R5 using this formula. So we get 8.45 kilo ohms resistor for R5. For frequency, we adjust R7 and C3 using the triangle wave frequency formula. We rearrange to find R7. Plugging in the values, we get 5.9 kilo ohms as the nearest standard value. Finally, we use a comparator to compare the error amplifier's output, which we call VSIN, with the triangular wave from the previous block. The comparator logic is simple. If VSIN is greater than the triangular wave at any point, the output is high, otherwise, it's low. This generates a PWM signal whose duty cycle is directly proportional to the value of the input signal. When the analog input is high, the PWM duty cycle increases. When the input is low, the PWM duty cycle decreases. At zero input, which translates 2.5 volts, at the comparator, we get 50% duty cycle. To sum it up all, the circuit takes an analog voltage input between minus 2 to plus 2 volts and converts it into PWM signal with 0 to 5 volt swing. The duty cycle changes according to the input voltage. All of this is done using just op amps and few resistors. And there you have it, a complete analog PWM generator built with just few op amps, resistor and some clever engineering. If you learned something from this, don't forget to check the description for references. We found this video useful. Hit that subscribe button and stay tuned for more exciting content.